She is a Canada Research Chair in Bachelor of Engineering. Um, she obtained her PhD from McGill University under the supervision of Dr. Nessie Asikhan and Dr. Theo Van. Uh, she then continued in her postdoctoral study in the PhD at the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems, and that was under uh, the supervision of Dr. Nessie Asikhan. Currently, so she joined McMaster in 2016. She's a member of the chemical engineering department and associate member of the biomedical engineering department, as well as a core member of the Farnfall Institute for Digestive Health, uh, the Center for Excellence for Protected Equipment and Materials, and associate member of this, uh, the Institute for Infectious Disease Research, the David Raley Center for Antibiotic Delivery. Uh, yeah, so she's a member of many of our core facilities. Uh, she's also an editorial board member for Scientific Reports, Associate Editor for the Canadian Journal of Chemical Engineering. Um, her research really focuses on responding to global biological threats using uh, bacteriophages. I think that's what we're going to hear about today, but it's been uh, the work from her lab has been uh, recognized and also uh, patented. So she has uh, received recognition for a lot of her work from Hazard, from Academia, Industry, Health Canada, and Public Media. Um, and I think also one thing I wanted to highlight is they have developed also award-winning bio aerosol platforms. And uh, as part of this research, uh, Dr. Hussini just has uh, collaborated closely with the Canadian Standards Association. So uh, with that, I'd love to hear more about your work. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Catherine, and thank you to the committee for, for the invitation. I will have to <laughs> cut down this bio. So the next time somebody send, tells me to send uh, send a bio, I'm not just going to send the full version. I'm going to send a very short version. But thank you. Um, so hi, everyone. Thank you for being here on a Friday afternoon. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about today is um, bacterial viruses. And so um, let me start with a, with a thought. So I came across, this is part of an illustration that I came across back in June. Um, I was due to give a talk at the Viruses of Microbes conference and I, and I was looking for, you know, a start into, into the talk. And I came across this illustration, which appeared um, in Nature end of June. And this is part of, so this was part of a tech feature on the importance of making your data accessible, right? For me, it had a, a completely different sort of a message. When I looked at this, I thought, this is a perfect example. Now, keep in mind, I was talking to a group of microbiologists, so as an engineer. And so I thought this is a perfect illustration um, to showcase the importance of putting knowledge to work. And it, it'll make sense to you if I show you the missing part. Ready? See what I mean? So it's, the, the, we're, familiar with the process of scientific discovery, no matter how impactful our discovery is, it's, you know, small uh, contributions. It doesn't matter if it's a nature paper or a smaller paper, it's still a, a small contribution to the, to, you know, the, the bigger picture and the bigger puzzle. And it's, uh, it might not look that important at the time that you're working on, on the question, but it, it does contribute to making sense of the bigger puzzle. And yes, the puzzle is usually much, much more uh, complicated than you know this illustration, but a picture is worth, worth a, a thousand words, they say, and, and this is really true in this case. The beauty of this is that there's a jumping from that body of knowledge to actually putting it to work. First of all, it requires a completely different set of skills and a different way of thinking. One, two, the beauty of it is that people with different backgrounds and different education, educational backgrounds, and even different life experiences, looking at the same body of knowledge, will find different ways to put it to work. So you can you know, rearrange those blocks and come up with something different. And so I want you to keep this in mind as I uh, go through the next few slides, because what I'm gonna talk to you about is a hundred year old discovery. This is not something that was discovered yesterday. 
and yet it still contributes to to uh, discovery of new technologies every day that you know one of the more recent ones being CRISPR but this you know phage is a, is a hundred year old discovery anyway moving on for those of you who might not be familiar bacteriophages are or bacterial viruses which I will from this point on call bacteriophages or phages these are uh, viruses of bacteria. And so in this illustration, you can see the three domains of life, and each of those domains have their exclusive viruses. To date, there has not been a report of viruses of bacteria jumping across the domain borders and infecting us. So that's good. That means it's safe uh, for humans. In fact, you have hundreds of trillions of bacteriophages living inside your body. Um, we're only scientists are only beginning to discover how important these viruses are for our health and well-being so that's something for those of you who are interested to, uh, to dive into um, one of the jobs in nature is to keep bacterial populations in check they are responsible for the immense diversity in the bacterial community so they just take genes from one bacteria and put in the other um, and the, the important thing is, and what, what makes them very, very um, uh, attractive, is that they are specific. And of course, we know that specific action is something that is engineered by nature. But, but the beautiful thing in contrast, these are, so their job is to keep bacterial populations in check. So they, simply put, they kill bacteria, right? You can think of getting some antibacterial action out of this or an, an, a new antimicrobial product. But they can be very specific, and this is in contrast to what we have with antibiotics. With antibiotics, the, the action is simpler. You just kill everything, right? If you take antibiotics, you, have, you, you wipe out some of the good bacteria, a lot of the good bacteria in your gut. Now, as I said, there's immense diversity in the bacterial world. Only a fraction of those are bad for us. We don't want to kill all of them. Again, we're only beginning to discover how important these bacteria are for our health and well-being and for the well-being, uh, the health of our environment. Anyway, so specific action, keep that in mind. Again, the ABCs, phages are viruses. So essentially you have a protein shell, you might have lipids in there sometimes, um, inside of which is a genome. And that genome could be DNA, RNA, single-stranded, double-stranded, circular, linear. And of course, being uh, viruses, they can't generate their own energy. They rely on a host cell to replicate. Again, keep in mind, they're very specific which host cell they choose. Um, and if you do a quick Google search of phage or bacteriophage, see that orange entity up there? That's, you'll likely uh, come across something like that. That is one of the many physical forms that phages can come in. But what that shows is, you know, the different proteins on the phage capsid or the outer membrane, each of which might be responsible for a different function. So, uh, as I said, these are viruses, they need to get inside the host cell to replicate. And so the proteins that are on the outside, they carry that function uh, or the responsibility of getting the genome inside the host cell. So there's that specific action that I talked to you about, the proteins that are responsible for. Okay, um, so 30 second view of how these were discovered. I told you this is a hundred year old discovery. So why am I talking about it now? For any history buffs in the audience, this is a very interesting sort of history of science story and books have been written about this. So um, 1917, bacteriophages were discovered by a French slash Canadian guy who was at the time working at Institut Pasteur in Paris. And he, he coined the name bacteriophages or bacteriophage, which means bacteria eater. Now keep in mind, these are viruses, so there's very little you can generalize in the biology world, but let's just say order of magnitude smaller than bacteria. They're not gonna eat and engulf bacteria. This was because the footprint he saw in his cultures looks like something was eating away at the bacteria, right? So he, he used the name bacteriophages used to this day. Two years before that, a, a British scientist, Frederick Twart, had similar observations. I mean. These were around for, well, basically forever, as, as long as bacteria have been around. So people are, are, are bound to notice them, but some people see and move away or work their way around them, and some people look carefully. Anyway, so he wrote this uh, article in The Lancet. He did not recognize that these were viruses. And um, 
the beauty of scientific publishing at the time, if you look at that article at the end, they didn't, they didn't really need to have a full story to publish. So if you, if you look at the particle at the end, uh, the article at the end, it says, this is what we saw. We're out of money. We're out of time. And we're really not interested in pursuing this further. So we present this, in this uh, to the scientific community. Use it any way you will. Um, but of course, these two people didn't know about each other because the world wasn't as connected. But anyway, that resulted in a lot of stories and a lot of controversy. But it is unanimous, unanimously agreed that, you know, uh, Durrell independently discovered bacteriophages. And of course, uh, he immediately set up, that he was a self-taught uh, biologist, immediately set up trials around the world. Durrell and the people who uh, followed his lead, and keep in mind, rewind, this was before antibiotics were discovered. There were very little cures for infectious disease. So people would die of what we consider simple infections today, right? So he immediately started phage therapy around the world. And by phage therapy, I mean the practice of using bacteriophages to cure infections in humans. And there are stories of uh, you know, people um, curing whole villages where the nearby village was wiped out by an infection. I mean, there are records, not stories. There, these, are, these are documented records of the impact that phage had and the impact is it wasn't just in the medical community or you know in the scientific community, in in the general public. I mean, there were products on the market in the 1930s, and in the general public, it had a huge impact. So, the novel you see there, Arrowsmith, this is a, a fictionalized sort of account of how phages came to be discovered and the controversy and all of that. And that won the Pulitzer Prize only a few years after phage was discovered. Which, which, if you if if you're familiar with the process of Pulitzer Prize, that speaks to the impact that that the, the, the phage had on the society. Anyway, so that's context in a, in a nutshell. That's a little bit of background for you. And uh, phages are still being used for treating infections and for biocontrol in the environment. But more of that later for anybody who's interested. I can, you know, we can have a discussion after the talk. All of this is good, but why would somebody like me, I, I'm an engineer through and through, so bachelor's, master's, PhD, postdoc, all of that. Why would somebody like me would be interested in bacteriophages? What is it that a, that a bioengineer would find attractive about bacteriophages? So three properties. One, specific recognition. So these are nanoparticles that have targeted action or targeted antimicrobial action. When I say targeted action, think targeted antimicrobial action, think uh, sensing. Again, uh, specific action is something that nature engineers. And so we use it a lot in, uh, in biosensing. You guys might, might be familiar with uh, DNA technology for sensing, aptamers, uh, uh, um, antibodies. Um, if you follow the diagram there, the orange entity, that's a bacteriophage. Again, it's an illustration of what people think all bacteriophages look like. From one to four phages, floating freely in, in the environment. These are part of, these are viruses. They do not have active locomotion. They do not swim, right? So they, they count on Brownian motion to get by. So if by chance it were to encounter a bacterial outer cell membrane, which is what you see at the bottom, that's part of the bacterial outer cell membrane. membrane. And if, again, it were lucky enough that the um, proteins on the tip of its tail fibers identified the matching proteins on the bacterial cell surface, then it would bind irreversibly and the, would trigger the process of getting the, D, uh, the DNA or the genome inside the cell, um, which is the start of phage taking over the cell machinery, right? So specific, specific action is one of them. Two, self-replication. You have a nanoparticle that can replicate more of itself. If there's any, anybody in, in the audience that has ever made nanoparticles, even spherical ones, you would know that it is not trivial to get a monodispersed suspension of nanoparticles, and yet nature makes these for us. So what you're looking at here, the white or the lighter particles, those are bacteriophages. The vessel that's disrupted, this is an electron micrograph. That is a bacteria. So after the genome gets in, the bacteria takes over the cell machinery, turns bacteria into a virus-making machine. And uh, at the end of, what, 20, 30 minutes, depending on the conditions, bacteria is lysed and the phages disperses the medium. So this is, um, this is what you see on a, a, a bacterial culture as 
the footprint of phage eating away at the bacteria. What you're looking at the circle, that's a petri dish. Inside of it is a jelly-like substance, which we grow bacteria on, which we call agar. You grow bacteria on there, it becomes cloudy, right? You can't see, you can't, it's not transparent. If there's phage in that bacteria, you see clearing. That's what the circles are. That's why Durrell called it bacteria phage, bacteria eater. Right, this self-replication is great. So, so far we have a nanoparticle that can make more of itself that, can, uh, that, that has uh, targeted uh, action. But there is, there is a challenge. They self, they replicate because they have a genome. Think of them as smart nanoparticles. Because they have a genome, they are subject to evolution. That's, that's a challenge and an opportunity. But again, it, it challenges everything that engineers, biotechnology specialists, uh, uh, pharmacies, uh, pharmacy um, researchers, uh, people out in, in pharma, it challenges everything we know about how to design an antimicrobial, because everybody knows how to design a product with a chemical, not with something that evolves and replicates, and, you know. Anyway, so this rapid evolution, what it looks like is that, if you look at the graph above, this is, uh, I don't remember which phage it was that we got this for. But if you look at the green and the blue, I, th I think this is the Mona stage, actually. The green and the blue curves, um, that is just a culture of bacteria growing. The turbidity, y-axis turbidity increases as the bacteria grows. Runs out of food, that's why you see it flatten out. Um, the red curve is if you add phage to that culture of bacteria, it, the, the turbidity drops down. It's killing the bacteria, it can't grow, right? But then you see the curve picking up. That's bacteria becoming resistant to phage. But if you look into that culture, that there is all sorts of things ha happening. There are phages that are also becoming um, evolving to attack the now resistant bacteria. So this is it. There is there is a world inside of that culture there, and you know there are papers written on it. So evolution is a challenge, but also um, but also a design parameter, if you will, which is something I've been saying since. Uh, since I was working on my PhD. Anyway, third property, diversity. So what I'm showing you here is the tip of the diversity iceberg, which is diversity in shape. Um, so you've got all sorts of different shapes for, uh, for phages. What I'm not showing you is the diversity in size. What I'm not showing you is the diversity in capsid composition, the diversity in the makeup of the genome, the diversity in the process by which they make more of themselves. We haven't even scratched the surface when it comes to diversity in the phage world. And so that's why when you say phage research, this is an umbrella term for a lot of things. <laughs> so everybody looks at it from, from a different perspective. Anyway, so there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of knowledge there. There's a lot of missing links going back to the first slide. But now as a bioengineer, I want to make use of this. So what I do is, that, I mean, the, 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 these properties are, uh, you know, the key ones that sort of motivate me and, and the people in my lab to uh, make a whole research program out of this, um, which is what we call bacteriophage bioengineering. And currently it has uh, three arms. So what you can see on this slide, aside from my attempt at destroying a, a perfectly good illustration, is the three arms of bacteriophage bioengineering that we're currently focused on, biomaterials engineering, by which we built high throughput assays, um, drug uh, delivery or phage delivery vehicles, and um, uh, sanitation products, interfacial engineering. That is the process by which you stabilize bacteriophages on an interface and make sure that it stays stable and active. So we've done uh, antimicrobial implants and again, biosensors with that and particle engineering, which unfortunately I won't be able to talk about today because we won't have the time, which is uh, formulating these into stable powders and aerosols, again, for, uh, for different applications. So let's jump right in. So what I'm gonna uh, sort of walk, walk you through today is in detail, we're gonna go through the sort of the genesis of the phage biomaterial engineering, how it started, where it ended up and where we're taking it. And then I'm gonna show you snapshots of more of the interfacial uh, uh, engineering work that we're doing. So this goes back to 2016 when I first started. The picture you see on top is my first, Azadeh is my first, uh, one of my first master's students. And so 
I kept uh, uh, thinking, you know, I, I want to make something, a material with these viruses, something that I can hold in my hand. And uh, as I was writing those first discovery grants, I was thinking, how, how am I even going to do this? But, you know, let's, let's make the promise and, and figure out how you're going to do it. But, you know, it's, uh, uh, there's no limit to what you can achieve when you, when you have a great team. So we started using um, filamentous viruses. These are nanofilaments. You can see the sizes there, very high aspect ratio. The orange uh, uh, picture or the orange filaments that you can see, that's an atomic force microscopy image. And that is uh, that alignment is achieved by convective assembly. And so you can see the phages bundling up, right? The, the protruding heads are the, the top of the phage. And these are large proteins they use to bind to bacteria. That's what you can see as more of a sort of a yellowish. Now, the fact that you can align these and, and sort of guide their self, uh, self organization, that's positive. That was really our starting point. And so we started sort of trying to bring these closer and closer together and concentrating these phase suspensions until at some point we saw um, patterns that you would only see in liquid crystalline suspensions or liquid crystalline material. So that's that's the 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 color pattern or the iridescence that you see with light. You see a different color based on the angle where you look at the material, and you don't see that at lower concentrations or water or you know any of the other controls, which is what you can see on the side. And so, the fact that that we could do this meant that the phages are coming very close to each other, and now we have a highly organized fibrous uh, uh, material which uh, we then used a very simple crosslinker, which is we had access to in the lab, uh, a small molecule crosslinker to crosslink these. And there we had it, a puck that we could hold in our hand, which was the, you know, the, the, the vision from the beginning. And now the question was, what do we do with it? Uh, of course, from the, the, there were things that we expected. There were properties that we expected. There were properties that we did not expect. Um, we knew that it was gonna absorb water because protein cross-linked, it was going to absorb some water, but this is, this is fairly good. Not, not as, you know, groundbreaking as some of the engineer, engineered hydrogels, but then with the electron micrographs, we saw this very beautiful layered ordered structure. And we, you, when we broke this up, again, you can see going into the screen, uh, bundles of phage. Break it up further, you can see what is clearly phage bundles. This is a material that has nothing else. It's phage and small molecule crosslinker. That's it. There's nothing else. And so, you know, we were we were very excited at that point. But then, now that I look at these images, I think, you know, we could have done better. Um, and we did. You'll see. So what we didn't expect was emitting light. Uh, we did not expect there to be autofluorescence, which you know could be good or bad depending on the application that you you want. Bad for sensing. Possibly good if you're trying to track something in vivo, which, you know, if you follow, this is a uh, proteinase, uh, which degrades the gel. Did I mention they're biodegradable? Of course, they're proteins. But uh, the, the fluorescence diminishes as the gel biodegrades, right? So at this point, what do we have? We have a puck made out entirely of bacteriophages. And we decided to take this further and see what else we could get out of it. So what my student that did was she cut the gels and she put it in a physiological concentrations of calcium. And we saw that fuse back again, which to this day, we haven't pinned down the actual mechanism. We have some ideas, but we haven't pinned down the mechanism. And again, you see the different colors there because these are different concentrations of the gel. Again, cut it down again, it fuses back in, in physio physiological concentration. You see the fault line or the cut line there in electron micrographs. All of that would have been useless for me if these gels didn't have bioactivity. So the vision from the beginning was, can I make a material completely out of phage that has the same intrinsic properties as the building blocks? That was the whole point. The whole point is getting, bringing, so the whole, the point of building with nature is to use the properties that nature, in, nature can only engineer in, in the best way. Anyway, so what we did was, um, as I took this puck and threw it in a, in a culture of bacteria, 
uh, wash it a few times or without wash, and she saw that phage was replicating. And so at the time we hypothesized, at the time we hypothesized that um, uh, it, this is probably because some of these filamentous phage, this is before the gel degrades, because once the gel degrades, you might have uh, more free phage. But the, the, the phage inside the material cross-linked, possibly some of these protruding heads that I mentioned are, are available on the surface and combine to the bacteria, which it is far from trivial. <laughs> It is extremely difficult to stabilize this so that they can perform their, 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 their biologic function inside solid material. They're not built to do this. They're built to be, uh, to be free. Anyway, so at that point, um, that the work got a lot of attention, which motivated my then uh, superstar PhD student to take over. And he came to me and said, I wanna change my project. I wanna work on this. Uh, and he was one year in his the pictures there on top, Lei Tian. Uh, he has his own lab now. So the idea then was, yeah, good, we have the material. What do we do with it? You decrease the scale. The material is antimicrobial. We know the phage is active. Let's make it smaller. Because you make it smaller, you decrease the, uh, uh, increase the, the surface volume ratio. You get more, more sites where the phage can come into contact with bacteria. So that's good. And so, this was the process that, that we used, um, which is a molding process. So we, he built these um, microporous honeycomb structures with the, with the polymer, which the droplets, the blue droplets that you see are just droplets of water that make a hole inside that, that polymer. And as it dries up, it gives you this, these beautiful honeycomb structures, which you can see here. The insert is what the, the polymer looks like. Uh, and again, zoom in, cross section, you can see the holes. And the cool thing was that, you know, you could stretch it to get different, different shapes of, of that mold. So technically you could make spindles. Anyway, um, so what we did with that was try to, um, try to get microparticles or micro bumps. Now, here's the thing. There are a lot of technologies that you can use to make microparticles or microgels. Almost all of them are inherently um, incompatible with biological entities. With, well, page is not a living thing, but you know, you're you've got solvents, solvents. You've got heat. They they degrade uh, uh, the 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 particle or the phage, the virus. And so that's why we set up on coming up with our own method, which is what I should have said in the, the previous slide. First, we had to develop a method to be able to decrease the scale and make something from viruses. So there's a lot of method uh, development that went into this. And so we, piloted, uh, we, we tested this with just proteins to see how, how that would work. And up on top, the forceps, that's holding a, a, a um, uh, a patch with micro bumps that you can see here in this uh, SEM image made out of proteins entirely. And again, zoomed in image, you have a high density of these micro bumps, which um, of course we could change the, you know, the diameter based on how we treated the surface of the mold, which was, you know, in itself good. We managed to make, you know, micro pores by double molding using another polymer, Ecoflex, which we then again use for um, as a control. So what do we do with this? Um, keep in mind, this is the process towards getting actual microgels. So there's, this is the process that he was uh, developing to get through actual making microgels. But then he thought, saw the microbombs and thought, this is really cool because I can make an antimicrobial patch like for a wound, right? And so what he did was he made the patch and in the process of making the patch, he added BSA um, uh, particles into the patch so as to make it rough, which you can see in, uh, on top. So the surface is rough. And we thought we can't, we've can't come this far. Let's see how it behaves. And so what you can see is um, the um, water contact angle on uh, just a, uh, a normal polymer uh, 
layer cast on polystyrene. And then with the smooth bumps and with the rough, uh, rough uh, bumps with the rough surface. And um, to our luck, we saw that, let me see. The de yeah, I can, I'm showing you the actual images. Um, that the density of bacteria, and this is Staph aureus, that would attach to these surfaces, and this is you know after I think 24 to 48 hours of incubation, drastically decreases. So at the bottom, you can see electron micrographs of Staph aureus attached to the surface. The the graph there shows you the numbers. So you can see drastically decrease in the attachment, which is you know in itself cool because think of phage that specifically binds and yet it repels uh, uh, a non-specific attachment. Anyway, so what you can see um, here is sort of a control. We wanted to make sure that this is not due to the material, but the structure, right? So we, we use that, remember the double mold with Ecoflex, we use that to make microporous sheets and subject it to bacteria, which of course we saw no difference. So staff just boom, attached to it. Okay. So up to this point, we have a method that would not destroy the entire structure uh, if we wanted to decrease the scale. So now's the time to make the page microgels. So now we take it a step further. Instead of having the microbombs on the surface, we want to release them from inside the mold. And how do we do that? Now, this in itself was a challenge um, because protein gels, virus-based gels, as we came to find out, are soft. And so uh, vortexing them, there's, you're not gonna be able to dissolve that mold, the solvents, because we don't wanna do that. Remember, solvent's bad. Um, and so, at the end, and this took a lot of, uh, of trial and error, but at the end, he settled on putting a piece of tape and, and tearing off the top layer, and the rest would come off easily. And I say easy, but I was a witness to, you know, what he went through to actually get this work. So what you see here it are the pores. So that's the mold inside of the pores. You can see the microgels. And the actual patch, which is flexible, and has a very high density of microgels. When you zoom in, what you can see and what you know, we were uh, pleasantly surprised to see was again, this beautiful alignment of fibers inside of the microgel. Um, and this is just the patch. So microgels inside the patch, you actually have a material they can hold in your hand. You can release the microgels from the patch. That's the, the uh, picture with microgels written on it free floating, so we can make a suspension of these microgels, which again, a different format gives you access for different applications. Right, I'm gonna skip the, the diameter again. You know, we did all sorts of characterizations, what the diameter of dried and, and not dried would be and, and the density. So one of the things that we really liked about the process was that you can make a very high density of microgels inside a tiny, tiny patch. Which when time comes to you know, actually make a product out of this, uh, it would decrease the cost. So um, we netted out a little bit and I, I made that into a verb. I'm uh, sorry, uh, and looked into the actual structure because the, the, the fiber structure for us was very, uh, very intriguing. And so when you zoom in, you're going to see the, remember, this is a filamentous phage, long, uh, high aspect ratio. So these are the fibers aligned bundles. And then you zoom in further and further, this is only a few phages bundled together. So that's why I said, you know, that the first images that we saw in the first work weren't as impressive as we thought at the time. Now, by comparison, um, small molecule protein put through the exact same process didn't give us that structure. Right. So to put all of that in perspective, this is how you would see filamentous phage with SEM, scanning electron micrograph. That's how you would see it. And that's with a very strong SEM. You, those hair-like lines that go across the surface, that's how you would see it. Because the diameter is very, very, very small. 
And so what we came up with at the end of the day were these tiny balls made entirely out of, out of these phage fibers. Um, and of course, uh, we, we still saw, this time we're, we were smart enough not to just use one crosslinker. And so we managed to sort of tune the, the autofluorescence based on the crosslinker that we use. Since with every application that we wanted to touch, that ended up to be a problem. Okay, so all of this is done and we're right in the middle of uh, shutdowns, the pandemic. And so we have a, a burn wound model ready to go. We can't use it. So what do we do? Um, you can't delay a, a PhD student graduating. So we shifted gears and we tested this not in a mouse model, but for food. That was much easier. And so um, for this, um, first of all, we tested whether or not the patch on the microgels um, showed any antimicrobial action. Now for that, we did two things. The patch itself, remember, so two different formats. Um, what you can see is the top view for a Petri dish filled with semi-solid uh, uh, growth medium, right, agar. And what you can see around the patch, so that's a square thing on top, that is inhibition of growth. And you can see for different bacteria, that is different, and of course, phage is uh, specific. And at the bottom is phage in a tiny spray sprayed on that, that agar. So again, you can see the clearing, right? So what we did there is we loaded these microparticles with additional phage. Now, here's the thing. This filamentous phage is excellent as a, as a structural component. I mean, excellent. It's just dream for, you know, material scientists. It's not as strong when it comes to its antimicrobial action. And besides, the, the host range is really, really tiny. And so for real life application, we will have to load in phages that target the bacteria that we're interested in, right? So staph, staph phage, pseudomonas, pseudomonas phage, right? So in this case, we loaded it with E. coli phage because remember, we're targeting food. And did a bunch of in vitro tests first. Well, at the time we thought we were going to move on to in vitro, in vivo, but so uh, tested this in, in lab cultures first before moving on to actual food products, where you can see that in both nutrient deficient and nutrient uh, rich environments, the spray manages to decrease or the page microgels manage to decrease the bacterial load. So that's nutrient deficient and nutrient rich, which um, represent different scenarios uh, of real life application. And again, these are endpoints, kinetic curves show uh, the same trend. Okay, so moment of truth. As I said, we decided uh, we're gonna move on to doing uh, like actual experiments on food products. And so uh, we paired up with, uh, with the Didar lab who does a lot of food research. And I thought, okay, so we're gonna do some high tech thing. And I always joke that they handed us lettuce and meat and said, that's it, go. And so uh, we sprayed, um, we artificially contaminated both lettuce, so that's your nutrient deficient medium, and meat, uh, that would be your nutrient rich medium, two different textures. So again, that's a, that's a whole different you know, discussion to be had about the texture of the material. But we artificially contaminated these and then sprayed phage on it, incubated it to see what would happen. And with lettuce, we could not recover anything. So completely uh, stopped growth. With, the, with meat, again, there's a texture difference and the loads are ridiculously high compared to what you, what you would experience in, in a real life scenario. We wanted to really challenge this. Um, with meat, you, we still had, we still could recover some, but drastically lower than the controls that were not treated with, with the microgels. So again, this shows that you pack phage into, um, microgels, or you actually, in our case, make microgels with phage or micro patches. So actual two different physical forms that can retain the bioactivity. And, and you might say, well, why, why, is, why would this be different from, you know, just spraying phage? 
right? Why go through this whole thing? So there is, there are very few active ingredients that make it into a final product in its raw form, especially with biologics. And when it comes to phage, there is a lot of supporting technology that is lacking. And there are three main sort of class of supporting technology. It's the delivery, stability, and accessibility, which you know each of these is a, is a talk in on itself. I've talked a lot about delivery, but there's an element of stability in this. If you spray phage, and we, we, we've done that for the publication, um, you spray phage, dries out, not active anymore. Now, remember, huge diversity. Some phages are more resilient to desiccation than others. But this is what you deal with when you're dealing with biological entities. They don't like being dried out. And when, you, when you're making a product, that becomes a little limiting. When you pack these inside a microgel, aside from delivering a very, very high load, much higher than you would be able to deliver with free phage, um, you are preserving moisture. Right, so you're keeping them active. This is one of the ways that uh, that you know we investigated for. for so, final story, and I'll wrap up. So far, I mentioned that you know there there are three major road uh, or technologies that supporting technologies that need to be developed to get phage into a product and so so far i've you know talked about the delivery and a little bit about stability there's uh, there's a lot of cool work that we've done on stability but i didn't talk about accessibility and that's a huge 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 issue now let me tell you why so let's step back the process of phage therapy, so actually curing a human that has a resistant infection. This is how it goes. Patient has an infection, does not respond to any antibiotics. So they send, the doctor sends the bacteria to the lab, comes back negative, 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 nothing works, right? That's when phage therapy starts. So there's an actual regulatory process for that. Of course, with all regulatory process, it could be streamlined, but we do have a process for it in Canada. And, and of course, uh, south of the border, they, they're doing a lot of this. So that's a starting point. That is when you are allowed to start the process for treating this patient with phage. Currently, what happens is you send the bacteria to another lab that has phages. That's it. That's that's really it. So you send it to some. If you're lucky and you know you're part of a university a university hospital, there might be a lab that works with phages that has some phages, and more often than not, they don't get any hits. So. People used to go on Twitter and say, hey, I've got this bacteria. Does anybody have anything? Um, anyway, you know what the root cause of that is? There is no centralized phage biobank. That is an accessibility issue. So, and this is this is because of the, the, the immense diversity in the phage world. I, there, um, there are biobanks in different institutions, different labs. In some countries, uh, army and, or navy labs, government labs might have their own biobanks that might not be accessible to civilians, but that is it. We might forever, need, this pages are the last beacon of hope against antibiotic resistance, and we might forever be reliant on multiple decentralized phage biobanks, right? So that is a problem that is worth exploring. So that's a third uh, sort of uh, um, issue that, that I mentioned. And so, the, the vision at the beginning was, all right, so why do we have to, why are we treating phage biobanks this way? Currently, phage biobanks are vials sitting in a fridge. If you want to be really serious about it, you, you, you uh, freeze dry it and then you lose a ton of activity. But anyway, phages are very, very stable in the liquid form in the fridge. And so the vision was, let's stabilize these in solid form, high throughput format, so I can ship it around the world plus the detection chemistry inside of these tablets. Sounds simple, right? Took first of their three years to actually make that. And if it was anybody else, I don't know if they would have actually been able to get through that. She's, a, she's an actual superstar. So uh, the, the idea was, again, going with something that, that's, that's very accessible. 
expensive, which we're trying to replace, but accessible, which is ATP detection. All living beings uh, produce ATP. Phage destroys bacteria, burst of ATP. That's what I want. I need a yes or no. I need a high throughput method. It gives me a yes or no. And so she stabilized both the phage and the biochemistry of detection inside these tablets and um, showed long-term stability. And so um, we tested these with um, human isolates that we got from the IIDR and an in-house library of any phage that we could find in the lab. And within 30 to 60 minutes with an unknown, unknown library, you could see um, the signal rise. And so that's sort of a depiction of what, what you would see. This is a snapshot, I think after 30 minutes. And the paper went for revision, came back and said, this is good, but we want you to triple the size of this library. And so now uh, she's finishing the revisions. The collaborations expanded across uh, beyond McMaster. So we've, we've paired up with a, um, a curator of a major biobank, phage biobank. And so we're testing on their biobanks. So you see what I mean with technology being missing, right? There is a lot that is involved in making an active agent into a product that people can actually use. And currently we're still living in hundred years ago. So most of the tools, methods that are being used are the same as Durrell would have used. That's it. So if we're serious about this, uh, we need to develop new technologies, bringing this back full circles, a circle. The other thing that this illustration uh, speaks to is the importance of not cross-disciplinary collaboration, but cross-disciplinary inclusion to opening up the borders of your discipline and inviting people in. Uh, there is not a single project in my lab that regardless of how it was initiated, it might've been myself and a PhD student, but in order to make an impactful work out of it, we always invite somebody in. And it's never somebody with a phage background. It's never a microbiologist. It's someone with completely fresh, uh, fresh eyes to look at it. Anyway, I am gonna wrap up. Thank you so much, everybody sitting here on a Friday afternoon. Um, thank you to funding agencies, wonderful collaborators, and you know these are the people who actually did the work. I didn't get to present their Melissa's work, Maddie's work, or Kyle's work. So there's they're they're doing really cool stuff. And I also acknowledge the two rugrats up there, which find every opportunity to tear my office apart. I can take your questions now. Um, because most of the phage that you advertise are mimic and destroy back. Yep. Right? Yep. I'm wondering, is there any application of isogenic phage yep. in better adhere to this diagnostics? And also, do you know the average speed of resistance development for those phages versus small molecule antibiotics? It's higher in phages. Okay. Average. Average. Again, very little that you can generalize. Um, so, you know, take that with a very large grain of salt. Mm, lytic and lysogenic in, in nature. So when I was doing my PhD back a million years ago, people were, you know, just adding antibiotics to lytic phage to see if lytic phage, uh, lysogenic uh, temperate phage would potentiate antibiotics in any way. And there were, there were so many papers on that. And it just felt, it just felt a little boring at the time. It has made a comeback and with full force. Now people are looking at the mechanism uh, of uh, potentiating the action of antibiotic and or phage with combining the two. And the, 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 um, the, the focus for a lot of that work is temperate phage, because the reality is, now uh, for everybody, I mentioned that there's diversity in the way that phages choose to uh, make more of themselves replicate inside of bacteria. And so that's what the lytic versus lysogenic versus again, the chronic are. Some phages get in, kill, some phages get in, and they're very sneaky, they stay inside the genome until something triggers them out. And again, there's no, not a full, we know some of the triggers, there's not a full understanding of all the triggers. And so that's the majority of phages um, that we know of are temperate. Most of the ones inside of our body are temperate. So the sneaky type, they stay. Um, and that's true. So currently the regulatory bodies favor 
the phages that do not get inside your, uh, the, the bacterial cell genome for obvious reasons. So they like lytic phages, the ones that go in and kill. That doesn't stop researchers, right? So there's a lot of research going on and using other phages. And again, there's, there's that idea of combining them with antibiotics um, to which the bacteria was previously resistant to and seeing if, if it potentiates bacteria action in anyway. Thank you. Um, I'm curious about the crosslinker. So you said it was a small molecule crosslinker? Yep. So this is just like crosslinking. Glutraldehyde. <laughs> that was the first thing that we used. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's, that is fair. And that's what, so the first one we started with this work, we just ordered a whole bunch of polymer crosslinkers of different length, because I, I thought that would give us a lot more flexibility in the material that was designed. It became a lot more challenging to crosslink with those. Again, this was when we were starting the work, relatively uh, low experience in actually crosslinking these, uh, these viruses. It became more challenging to use those crosslinkers versus just glutaraldehyde. Now, I know small molecule crosslinkers, both glutaraldehyde and EDC, they're limiting. Um, you have to increase the concentration a lot. You can't control the pore size as much as you will, as, as much as you would want, uh, let's say, if you want to use for drug delivery, right? So polymer crosslinkers are, they give you a lot of, a lot of freedom. At the time, it was much easier to cross-link and get through the other challenges and then, you know, come back, try other cross-linkers. And we keep coming back to cross-linkers. We keep, you know, trying this and that cross-linker to see what it would give us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, so the microgels currently, they do retain a, a good amount, a good amount of water for to keep the phages inside the microgels active. So that that's fair. And uh, PEG uh, crosslinkers were the, uh, the crosslinkers that we, we ordered. So, you know, we, we keep going back to those, playing around to see, you know, what, what advantages they could give us. But yeah, the only answer I have for you is we got one to work. <laughs> Yeah, so you have liquid cholestyrene, right? I mean, you control the humidity to an extent and you flow water vapor over it. And then that condenses, drops down onto the mold. And this is a, this is a process that people have used for different applications. And it, it does take a little bit of tweaking, but you can control the size of those pores uh, by controlling the temperature and, and uh, well, temperature you can't do as much by controlling the humidity. It did take, so this was at the very, very beginning of the pandemic. It, it was, it cut right through uh, Lay's work, but it, it did take him a while to be able to control the sizes. Yes. Fairly uniform. Once you, once you manage to tweak it, it's fairly uniform. So what I showed you in the slide, it wasn't a representative image, like all around you can see fairly uniform pores. And again, the density you can control to an extent, how far apart they are. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the the pictures of the the mice with the implant that that was one of the biofilm works uh, work that that we did with the phage stabilized on surfaces. We've done uh, studies with free phage. You're right. So bacteria inside a biofilm. That's a community of bacteria. For those of you who might not be familiar, this is their normal state in nature inside our bodies. They like to make communicate communities because they protect themselves. That's bad for us because once they get into these communities, they become resistant to antibiotics. And you know, it's the numbers thrown out there, but they say a thousand times more 
concentration of antibiotics than you would use for just non-biofilm or planktonic bacteria. So this, this is a huge problem. And true phages can contribute for two reasons. Um, uh, one of them being the enzymes that they produce. Well, one, one, one would be the e evolution, because there's, there's, there's that aspect of resilient cells forming inside the biofilm. But the other aspect is antibiotics can't get in, right? Phages, some phages encode enzymes that degrade that, the, the matrix that biofilms, uh, that cells inside the biofilm produce. So there's that aspect of it. And we've, uh, I didn't show the work here, so we've shown that for sensors, for environmental sensors that you leave out and biofilm forms on top, that with the treatment of just free phage, wipes it out. You still, you still get some residue on the surface, but the sensor, the response time, and the signal to noise ratio is as good as a new sensor. So there's, there, there is work inside of the body. The picture is much more complex, but there is, there is work, uh, work there. Yeah. Well, thank you, Jeremy, and uh, thank you, Dr.